Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. This is your host, Tho Bishop, not joined today by Ryan McMakin, who is surviving the Vegas heat out at Freedom Fest. Look forward to catching up with him next week about all the big things going on over there. So I'm joined by our producer, Connor O'Keefe, and a special guest today, William Yarwood, who is the media campaign manager for the Taxpayer Alliance over in the UK. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, British politics, the big election that they had, ironically, on 4th of July last week. Uh, but before we get into that, a reminder that this is the current events podcast of the Mises Institute. We've got a few major events that I want you guys to be aware of. We have talked for a few weeks now about our supporters summit coming up in October, October 10th to the 12th in Hilton Head, South Carolina. The uh, theme of the day will be Our Enemy, the State. A lot to pick through there, and it will be the world premiere of our documentary, Playing with Fire, uh, Money Banking in the Federal Reserve. That is going to be a historic moment there in the history of the Mises Institute. Very excited for that. And then in November, we will be having an event down in beautiful Fort Myers, Florida on elections in the economy. Do they really matter? So if you want to get answers to that question from folks like Tom DeLorenzo, Mark Thornton, and the great Murray Sabrin, um, you can sign up right now at the Mises.org slash events page. And if you do not have your copy yet of what has government done to our money, that is still a, uh, a gift out there. If you go to Mises.org slash money, you get a copy for yourself. If you got some groups that you want to spread the good word with, you can do that as well. But Mises.org slash money is where you can find that great book. Uh, Connor today, should be mentioned, has a great article up uh, dealing with the question of if Biden is obviously not running the country, um, who is? Highly recommend checking out his uh, regular weekly Wednesday column. Connor, how does it feel being in Ryan's shoes today here on Radio Rothbard? Yeah, some big shoes to fill for sure, but I'm uh, I'm excited to be here and excited to to talk a bit about the UK election, something I know a little bit about, but not much. So I'm excited to uh, to, to learn. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that is a great bridge, bridge to our guest today, which is Mr. Yarwood, who has joined us in the past on Radio Rothbard, one of my favorite young Brits out there. And uh, so, William, let's just get it started. First and foremost, um, what the hell happened to the Conservative Party? Um, you know, I know that for, for people that have been following along with this, I don't think it was a completely unexpected outcome. Um, you know, when the conversation is about zero seats, that's not typically a good sign for a political party. Obviously, they did not quite get to that level of the air there yet. Um, but let's just start right there. What happened to the Conservative Party, the, the longest continual political party um, out there? What, what brought us to this point of this kind of major collapse from the Conservative Party over there in the UK? Yeah, completely. Well, first of all, thanks, though. Thanks, Connor. Thanks for having me back on Radio Rothbard. It's been quite some time. Uh, the last time I was on, we talked about Boris Johnson uh, just leaving, prime in the, uh, being prime minister. And now we're talking about a completely new government uh, coming into uh, power. So there's quite a lot happened since uh, uh, since last time I saw you guys. But it's great to be back on. Great to talk to you about what the heck has happened. And I think really the collapse of the Conservative Party can be put down to a few uh, main points. The first one is that the 2019, what I like to call the Brexit coalition, completely collapsed. So in 2019, uh, Boris Johnson went into that election or called an election, basically arguing that Brexit needed to be done because Brexit, ha although uh, Brexit had been voted on in 2016 um, and there was a pretty emphatic leave vote, there was lots of obfuscation in Parliament, um, you know, not a conservative majority in Parliament either, so they couldn't get things through properly. Uh, and when Boris became leader in 2019, after the resignation of Theresa May, um, he called an election in December to say, right, we need to get Brexit done and I'm the man to do it. And um, that resonated with a lot of people in the north of England and in Wales, uh, many people who had not ever voted for the Tories before, but had voted leave. And they saw Boris as basically the way to get that over the line. But also because Boris had promised them uh, what he called levelling up, which is essentially redistributing money uh, to those more deprived areas in the north of England, whether that be in the form of new housing, whether it be in the form of new transport or, or whatever it might be. Um, and Boris managed to get that 
uh, majority of around, I think, 80 to 85 seats in 2019, which was considered a historic conservative win. Um, but at the recent election, the one that just happened, a lot of those seats disappeared and went back to the uh, Labour Party, predominantly because the Tories did not fulfil many of their promises, if any of their promises, over the last four to five years. Uh, Brexit was delivered, sure, but there's still some questions regarding immigration, because after all, uh, migration was one of the reasons people voted to leave the European Union and migration, uh, both from the European Union and indeed outside the European Union, has skyrocketed to the highest it's ever been. Um, also, the levelling up funding that was promised to some areas of the North and Wales simply hasn't materialised in the way that they'd like to see those uh, things materialise. Um, but also, uh, the Conservatives, in a way, actually didn't essentially govern as Conservatives. Uh, taxes, as we at the Taxpayers Alliance have found out, are set to rise to an 80-year high, which is absolutely insane. That's the highest they've ever been since the end of the Second World War. Uh, debt is at 100% of GDP, uh, which is also crazy. Um, and the Conservative Party has consistently thrown money into uh, radical progressive quangos and activist groups, which consistently undermine the Conservative government and their ability to govern. Um, and also, after 14 years, people are sick of the Conservative Party, in all reality. Um, people just wanted something different. Um, and the current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, made multiple mistakes during this election, whether it's the fact that he left a D-Day uh, event early, uh, which many people thought to be completely unpatriotic and people attacked him relentlessly for that. Um, the fact that when he first announced the election, he gave it in the rain, he gave a speech in the rain, uh, which uh, was plastered on every single uh, front page newspaper in the country with, you know, titles of Drowned Out and Soon Act Swamp Thunder and things like that. Um, so that was a, not, a, not a look that they typically want to um, put forward either. Um, but also, uh, they just couldn't capture the narrative at all. Uh, their communications during this election had been quite dire. Nobody was on message. Uh, Tory MPs went rogue to the extent that local Tory MPs didn't even include the word conservative on their banners or their leaflets um, and were running essentially local campaigns. The Prime Minister himself, Rishi Sunak, uh, one of his banners said a local voice for his constituency. Hello, he's the Prime Minister. Why the hell is he running on a local voice platform? Like that's, even he was running that as well. Um, and also, I think the, the most important thing to mention is that Labour's campaign was really, really, really slick. Um, it was uh, coordinated. Everyone was on message. There was no scandals, uh, unlike the scandals which the Conservatives had, where Conservative MPs were betting against themselves. They were taking money down to the betting shop and betting against... <laughs> Gotta respect that play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is absolutely crazy, including the Prime Minister's own chief whip, uh, as well as some of uh, the Prime Minister's security detail. Uh, we're betting on when the election were and when on what Tories would lose. Um, so uh, Labour didn't have any scandals. They were really slick. Um, they targeted a lot of key areas that they'd lost in 2019. Um, but also in regards to other parties, just the Liberal Democrats and Reform, the Liberal Democrats completely targeted Tory seats in the South and what's called the Blue Wall, uh, where they sold the message that the Tories were too right wing, which is a message that some people in the South of England completely and utterly bought and therefore voted for the Liberal Democrats, who are more sort of centrist, um, uh, sort of progressive party, uh, not dissimilar to sort of uh, the softer edge of the Democrats in the United States. Um, and also uh, the Tories lost seats off of reform, namely in Great Yarmouth and Clacton, uh, where uh, Rupert Lau, who is the uh, reform candidate there, won a pretty decent majority off of a Tory safe seat, which was Great Yarmouth. And Clacton has also been a Tory safe seat for quite some years. And Nigel Farage stormed in and took that over also. Um, so in all reality, uh, with... Farage coming back, Labour running a slick campaign, the Lib Dems targeting Tory seats in the South, and also the Tories not having a clear or coherent message, nor any level of unity. Um, it was all posed to be an absolute collapse and a failure. But in many ways, the Conservatives should have expected this because the polls haven't changed in two years. Um, Labour has been consistently ahead, against the, ahead of the Conservatives by about 15 to 20 points ever since the middle of 2022. Well, ever really since Boris Johnson resigned, if I'm perfectly honest with you. Um, so to see the Conservatives lose this election, um, not as bad as they might have considered losing the election. After all, they still held on to 121 seats, although some of those seats they held on uh, by the skin of their teeth by maybe a few hundred votes. Um, to see them lose is not a surprise. 
Uh, and I think many Conservative voters out there are also not surprised that they lost either. And many Conservative MPs are not surprised that they lost either. So I think in reality, judging by the polls over the last two years and how the election went, it was kind of inevitable, the result that we saw the other week. Well, again, and just to, to help our audience kind of understand, like, you know, you know, we think about parties losing, things like that. One of the things I find most fascinating is just the number of big personalities that, you know, I think your, your average American, right, you know, if they think about British politics at all, right, um, you know, some of the figures, and obviously Boris, Boris Johnson was, was you know, hasn't been in Parliament for a while, but he's, he's firmly on the sidelines. Um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who, you know, I think is, was a, a very popular, uh, he, 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 talking about the power of aesthetics and, and announcing in the rain, right, as, as a negative, like Rees-Mogg has a very, very posh, like he kind of looks like what you would think of a, of a, of a British conservative looking, he's, he's out relative to our audience. Um, Steve Baker, who was a voice for Austrian economics, he's out. Um, Liz Trust, uh, she, she's out. Um, uh, the former prime minister, um, Sunak, he, he, it looked like he was, he, he, he was possibly going to lose his seat outright. He did, he did cling on there. And so just even, like some of these major personalities losing their seats in the, the tidal wave of this election is I think just really draws in, you know, it's even in America, right? When, when you have a bad outcome for a political party, typically, you know, some of the, the stalwarts, right? You know, they, they stick around forever, for better or for worse. Um, you know, it's kind of like these, these mid-level congressmen that nobody, you know, even bothers to, to remember their names are the ones that are affected the most. But like some of the major power players, or at least the perception of these major figures, these long-standing conservative figures being ushered out in this major wave just kind of goes to the extent to which um, this really was kind of a collapse of the conservative party. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, some of those losses were uh, completely insane. I mean, I don't think anybody at the beginning of the evening had predicted that Liz Truss was going to lose her seat at all. Um, I think um, some people predicted, say, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps or um, Penny Mordaunt, who is the leader of the House of Commons, were going to lose their seats. Although I, I will say, uh, as I said earlier, some of them did hold on by their uh, by the skin of their teeth. Jeremy Hunt, who the Chancellor, now Shadow Chancellor, um, he was expected to lose to the Liberal Democrats, but won by about 800 votes. Again, predominantly because he ran a very, very local and tight-knit campaign. Uh, that even you know Lib Dems couldn't outflank him because he's been the MP for that area for for you know almost a decade I think. Um, so yeah, I mean the level of personalities, if you can call them that, that were gone on the evening was quite surprising. Um, and in the UK we have a term called the Patillo moment, uh, which is in for those who don't know, in 1997 when Tony Blair swept to power. Um, it was considered that lots of Tory MPs were going to lose their seats, such as in the recent election. But there was the Secretary of State for Defence then, Michael Portillo, who was considered to be you know, a darling of the Conservative right and a Eurosceptic and someone who was going to hold on to their seat and possibly be the next leader of the Conservative Party. Um, but when he went to his count, um, he lost his seat and nobody expected him to lose his seat. He'd been on the BBC a few hours earlier talking about how the Conservative Party needs to rebuild. And, he, you know, he was sad about the Conservative loss, but he didn't seem like he was sad about losing his seat because he was about to become possibly Tory leader. But then a few hours later, he stuck there at 3 a.m. in a leisure centre, you know, losing his seat, you know, uh, sleep deprived and miserable. Um, so uh, the, the, the way in which UK politics works sometimes is is very interesting. Um, that in a way, even on election night, you can't predict these personalities going. Um, because also a lot of these people relied on their personalities to get them through their election. I mean, Penny Morden especially was extremely popular in her local area, but that wasn't enough to stop her. Liz Truss even considered extremely popular in her local area. That didn't stop them turfing them out. Now, of course, there is some issue regarding whether the Tories lost because of reform stealing away of the votes. And I think in Liz Truss's seat, that's certainly something you can argue. Um, but in other seats where uh, they lost, like, for example, in Welland Hatfield with the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, or in, um, or where, uh, what's it called, uh, Penny was in Portsmouth. Uh, Labour just came in and completely dominated, but also because a lot of the Tory voters that would traditionally vote for the uh, for Penny or for Grant or for the Conservative Party more broadly just stayed at home because they weren't enthused by the election. They weren't enthused by, Star, uh, by Sunak. They weren't even enthused by the local candidates. Um, so to see all these personalities go, especially ones that have been there, for the, for the majority of, of my life, really, especially as the majority of my political life, is, is certainly weird. And to watch the House of Commons, which um, came back yesterday, fill to the brim of new bustling faces who you've never seen before is extremely interesting. 
Um, but yeah, it's a sea change in British politics. And I think, you know, getting some new personalities in uh, both political parties is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it certainly shows that there has been uh, a almost clear out of uh, a lot of high level cabinet ministers and high level backbenchers who have represented what the Tories have done over the last 14 years. Uh, and it will be interesting to see which new personalities come forward uh, as the Tories, of course, uh, vie for their centre of their party and vie for the leadership of their party. And speaking of new personalities, could you talk a little bit about um... So with Labour's victory, them forming a government, um, you know, what, what that's going to look like? I guess the Tories have been in power for, you said, 14 years. Um, you know, now they have their new prime minister up there uh, checking his notes a lot in his opening speech, apparently. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, is this going to lead to any substantial changes uh, in, you know, British foreign policy, domestic policy? Uh, could you just yeah, give some details on that? Yeah, sure. I think I will preface it with it's a little bit too early to tell because, of course, they've only been in, well, less than a week at, at this point. But there are a few things to say about Starmer and how he's governed maybe just over the last week is that he's been very quick out of the gate with some of the stuff he wants to push forward because he's he's been hungry for this. He changed the Labour Party from four years ago losing, you know, they lost an election against Boris and it was the worst election defeat they'd had, I think, since the early 1900s. Um, and he had to spend a lot of time rebuilding that party from the, you know, from the bottom, really. What I mean, and he turned it into a centre left. Um, I wouldn't say Blairite in the sense that it was exactly the same as New Labour, but it's got airs of New Labour, especially in regards to its slickness and also in regards to its lack of sort of ideology in it. It's not explicitly socialist. It's certainly social democratic, but it's not explicitly democratic socialist in the same that Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, was, or even Ed Miliband to some extent uh, in 2015. Um, and to Starmer's credit, he has put it on the winning uh, foot. He's consistently said about how um, Labour can't live with outside of its means. You know, everything has to be, you know, uh, everything, everything we spend has to be checked and tested. Um, and also, interestingly, um, he has vowed not to raise income tax, uh, national insurance or VAT which is very interesting for a Labour leader to say that, because most of them would even go and say, oh, well, we're going to increase uh, income tax on, say, the top 1% or whatever it is, or we're going to increase national insurance tax. But Starmer's said, no, we're not doing any of those things uh, in order to sort of regain the level of economic credibility that uh, they've lost over many years, because the Tories were always considered to be the party of economic credibility, but post-trust, uh, and post the supposed you know collapse of the economy, which is what Labour's line was against that period, um, Labour has been able to move into that space and been seen as credible on the economy. Um, but in regards to the few things they've actually done thus far, um, one thing they've started to do is they've started to talk about prison reform. Um, so the issue in the UK is that we don't have enough prisons, we've got too many prisoners. But what is Labour's uh, solution to this? Labour's solution is not necessarily to build new prisons. It's to release uh, over 40k prisoners who have served half their sentence, which is, I mean, that's just classic anarcho-tyranny, isn't it? I mean, that's just classic. Um, release these prisoners onto the streets um, in order to free up spaces for, for other prisoners. But I mean, they have said that there's only going to be low level criminals coming out. But again, like things always slip through the cracks. But that's one of the first things they want to do. And they've uh, actually uh, installed a man called James Timpson, who is the founder of uh, Timpsons in the UK, which is a sort of key cutting and, you know, uh, uh, sort of odds and ends sort of shop. And it's, it's you know, and Timpson is um, known for hiring uh, offenders. And he's known for his very strong views on rehabilitation. And they've decided to make him a lord because he wasn't an MP. So he's been, um, so Keir Starmer's gone to the king and said, can you make this person a lord in the House of Lords? The king has said yes. And now this man has been put in a cabinet position, namely Minister for Prisons at the Ministry of Justice. Um, so it sort of shows where Starmer's priorities are in regards to crime and security. And the second thing he's also done is he's completely abandoned the Rwanda scheme, uh, which was the scheme whereby uh, illegal immigrants who came to the United Kingdom were going to be pushed over to Rwanda in planes. Uh, and I think the UK government has given uh, millions, millions upon millions to uh, Rwanda over the last few years. But uh, I think only three illegal immigrants have actually been deported to Rwanda. Uh, while the Rwandans use it to build new ravines and fund their welfare programs, we're sending, uh, you know, we're sending millions over there all, all the while that we put um, illegal immigrants up in migrant hotels, which cost 
well, I think the taxpayer, about £8 million a day, uh, which is absolutely insane. Uh, but he scrapped that um, scheme completely and said that it's a gimmick and it costs too much. Uh, but he hasn't put anything else in place to curb illegal immigration. Um, and in regards to economics, um, his chancellor, the new chancellor, Rachel Reeves, uh, came out and gave a speech at the Treasury on, I think it, I think it was just the other day. It was, I think it was just on Monday. Um, and uh, Reeves has eventually said that she's told the civil servants that she wants a spending review on her desk like as soon as possible. So essentially what she's doing is give me a Tory blame sheet of what they've done over the last 14 years and let me show, so you can show me how bad the economy is. So when she goes um, to Parliament in a few weeks' time and reveals it, she can say, oh, guys, you know, the economy's so bad, we're going to have to put up taxes. I really didn't want to do that. Well, they might do that. You never know. Um, but they have come out of the gate on uh, wanting to basically sort the public finances out um, and also actually on planning reform. Uh, so Reeves has essentially gone to war with what's called nimbyism, which is not in my backyard uh, types. And those type of people are typically actually conservative voters. Um, people who are against having housing or nuclear power plants or wind farms or whatever it might be built in their community for you know, a variety of reasons, whether they think it will decrease the house prices or ruin England greens and pleasant land or whatever it might be. And she said, no, uh, we're going to have planning reform um, and we're going to remove the bans on onshore wind. Um, which is not an innately in, not an innately negative thing, but the question is how much pressure is she going to face from local NIMBY groups? And they're a big group in the UK, huge group in the UK, and they're very active. Um, and how much is she actually going to be able to get through in Parliament? Because also many of her own MPs will likely oppose some of the developments that she's uh, that she's planning along with uh, the new Deputy uh, Prime Minister Angela Rayner, who is also the Minister for Housing and communities and local government. Um, so they've really come out the really come out the gate on a few things, but the issue is is that's a lot of talk, talk at the moment. Um, and I think that, as I've shown you, in terms of priorities, uh, they're predominantly focused on domestic issues at the moment. Um, but I think eventually um, they're going to turn their eye to foreign policy issues, as we've already seen with David Lammy, the new foreign secretary, um, cuddling up to the European Union um, and saying that he wants to build a better relationship with the European Union. So whether there's any um, any change in our policy with the European Union will be certainly interesting to see down the line. But yeah, prison reform, planning reform, sorting out the public finances, um, scrapping the Conservatives' failed illegal immigration schemes, uh, and also uh, considering a new relationship with the European Union are really the first few things the Labour government has done. Um, and I expect that's what's going to define the next uh, six to eight months. And then as, as you mentioned there, right, I, I think it is helpful just for our, our American audience to understand, right, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, who was the previous labor leader, you know, he was kind of seen almost like a, like a Bernie Sanders type figure. Um, you know, he was, he was kind of a, a true, true blood socialist there, where with Sterner, you have kind of, you know, as, as you mentioned, this sort of Tony Blair realignment and for particularly our younger audience that might not be as familiar with kind of Blair, Blairism, right, you, know, you, you can think of Blair almost like a Bill Clinton like figure who, you know, had a, a lot of uh, particularly kind of social views on the left, but kind of adopted, you know, kind of co-opted, you know, welfare reform and, and sort of these um, these kind of steps to uh, uh, what, what, you know, physical conservatism, if you neoliberalism, if you will, right? And I, I think that kind of gets to the point of where British politics was now, where if you have a conservative party that is not conservative on just about anything in terms of policy, and you have a center left party that is moderating on that end, then you have this you know, delightful you know, not a lot of contrast between the two um, in the eyes of voters. And, and of course, like this is precisely the sort of, of mushy, um, you know, interventionist state that, uh, uh, you know, we, we abhor. Um, and I know we've gone a long time without uh, talking about uh, uh, Nigel Farage. We'll get to that in, I think, the next question here. But, you know, one of the problems that exists, um, you know, Liz Truss, you know, was shortest term prime minister. And here you had someone bad foreign policy views, right? You know, there's, there's plenty of stuff to pick there. But the narrative of Liz Trust, I think, is relevant. I know Daniel Lacaye uh, on our site had some good articles on this, that here is someone who was trying to propose some, some more serious economic reforms as a prime minister. You had sort of rebellion in financial markets not wanting to kind of deal with some of these difficult issues. And you have, with 
the background of all this is that particularly you know, younger Brits, the same way that you know younger Americans are getting screwed over for, by the financialization in the U.S. economy, you have you know throughout Europe, right? You have younger generations that have you know less opportunities. You're right, the, the the generational economic conflict is, I think, you know, is is a shadow over any sort of political environment out there um, within Western democracies, those with sacred institutions and the like, right? And and so and it, it seems like the conservative party during this campaign was kind of doubling down on its war on Zoomers, um, if you will, with with some of their proposals. So can you just talk a little bit about, you know, as as a you know as a, as a twenty something year old Brit, um, you know what you know what is the feeling amongst people your age in terms of the economic environment? Um, I'm, I'm sure there was probably some that uh, were were more excited by the cultural aspect that the political left was seeing. I mean, there, there was definitely an aspect of, of young right wing energy in the, the reform party, which can, we'll, we'll get to here shortly. But like, what is the, the state of British, the British economy, particularly for the younger generation? Sure. I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, one of the most important things in this country is the fact that taxes are set to rise to an 80 year high. And when you add young people into that, they are paying. Uh, obviously, they have student loans, which the Conservatives raised um, to £9,250 per year. Um, and also the Conservative Party has also increased interest rates on those loans. So young people are paying a higher marginal rate of tax than they ever have done before. Um, in also regards to um, how young people are feeling just generally, I'd say relatively despondent. I mean, one of the things that has motivated many young people to vote for Labour is Labour's promise of housing and planning reform. Um, it is borderline impossible um, for many young people, especially my age, to get on the housing ladder um, simply because either houses don't get built or they're too expensive or even where they are built, they're not built in the correct areas where young people would want to live. Um, and Labour's promise of, you know, destroying the NIMBYs and just building, building, building has won over some young people to their cause. But of course, the Conservative Party, and uh, we've seen this recently with many Tory backbench MPs coming at it against Reeves planning reforms, saying mm, Reeves wants to concrete over green, England's green and pleasant land, even though Reeves have, has, of course, said nothing like that at all. She just said, I think we should build more housing and maybe onshore wind's a good idea. And the Tories, because a lot of their base is, you know, over 65, uh, their pensioners, their homeowners, people who haven't got a mortgage anymore, they paid it off years ago. Um, they think that the problem with young people getting on the housing ladder is that young people spend too much money on Netflix and Costa and spend too much money on video games rather than the innate problem that intergenerational wealth has increased drastically over the last 14 years and the fact that now many young people can't get on the housing ladder. I mean, there was a really depressing statistic about the fact that there are many people in their early 30s still living with their parents in the UK, and I'm sure that's very similar in the US. Um, but in, to relate it back to the Conservative Party slightly, you are right, the Conservative Party recognised they weren't getting this demographic, so they decided just to go full appeal to their base. And the two things they did was, first of all, was they did what they called a national service, uh, where they were saying, we're going to bring back national service in, but but it's not the national service that we've known in the past. It's not, you know, going abroad to, to, to fight and die for your country. No, it's uh, delivering prescriptions to care homes and litter picking and, uh, you know, all those kind of menial community activities. Uh, and uh, young people would do, you know, a weekend every single month out of their time and give back to the community and it would build them up skills. Um, and there was quite a funny moment, I think, uh, when Rishi Sunak visited a secondary school and this uh, this Zoomer came up with his camera and said, Prime Minister, why do you hate young people? <laughs> and Sunak's, Sunak's simple response was, oh, you know, I think we're going to get some great skills. And this kid, what skills can I learn from litter picking? <laughs> You know, what, what skills are gonna, am I going to learn from that? Um, but that was a drastically unpopular policy, not just with young people, but with uh, people in their 30s and their 40s. The only group who liked it was, as you imagine, over 65s who are, of course, too old to do national service and remember the good old days and are typical people to vote for Conservative Party. So, yeah, they're the only ones who really appealed by it. And the second thing they did is, uh, well, just a little bit of context, in the UK we have something called the triple lock on pensions, which is what Cameron and Osborne introduced when they first got into government in the early 2010s, which means that pensions go up every single year in line with inflation, um, meaning that 
I think in terms of every other benefit, yeah, it is the only one that has gone up with inflation over the last 14 years. So if you're receiving a state pension, you are better off than you were in 2010. But that wasn't enough for the Conservative Party. No, they said we need to give them more. So they announced what they called the triple lock plus on pensions, a quadruple lock on pensions, uh, which it didn't really mean anything. It sort of meant the policy was exactly the same. But they were sort of signaling where their policy priorities were, right? They were saying, you know, we're going to force young people to clean up after you. And also we're going to make sure that they continue to pay for your uh, your very generous pensions all the way into the future. Um, and of course, the third thing is, of course, uh, nimbyism. Uh, the Tory party uh, more or less completely opposed any sort of idea of planning reform. Uh, they went on, you know, talking about our, you know, our beautiful land and our countryside and all those kind of, you know, Tory romantic images of England. Um, and uh, for young people, they're just simply not interested because young people predominantly live in cities or large towns, um, and many of them are desperate to get on the housing ladder and desperate to do well in their life. And when they have a Conservative Party, which is telling them you're going to spend every other weekend picking up litter, most of your taxes are going to go towards uh, pensions, which have gone up over the last 14 years. Oh, and by the way, you're not going to be able to buy a house. I mean, who's going to vote for them? And yet the weirdest thing is 12% of 18, 24 year olds still voted Conservative anyway, uh, <laughs> which, you know, makes me giggle. Um, but the funniest thing is it, is it doesn't have to be like this. Um, I read a very interesting uh uh, article from Spectator a few months back where it talks about um, Thatcher and uh, young people. And the funny thing is, is that actually uh, in 1979 and 1980 uh, 1982, um, Thatcher won over 40% of 18 to 24 year olds and over 40% of 25 to 34 year olds, which is absolutely insane considering the current voting uh you know, the current voting base for the Conservative Party, which is over 65s. Uh, but why did Thatcher win that generation? It's because she promised opportunity, she promised houses, she promised free markets, uh, she promised, you know, a, a better life. And she didn't, you know, expect them to go and do national service. They didn't, they, she didn't expect them to um, cough up more of their money for, for you know, uh, for welfare schemes. She offered them something new, something exciting. Uh, and that message genuinely appealed to young people. And that's how Thatcher built up a generation of conservatives. Many of those conservatives now who are now in their 60s and 70s, they were part of the Thatcher generation who were brought up via there. Uh, but what they've done is they sort of forgot why they voted conservative in the first place, which, of course, is because of the free market and uh, pro opportunity and pro house building angle. Um, but the problem is, is that I think the Conservative Party is going to take a long while to learn from any of this. Um, and I don't foresee in the future that the Conservative Party, at least in the next five years, will heavily pivot towards young people. Although I will say there's there's some good work in some of our circles regarding this, about how the Conservative can appeal to young people, whether it's to do with student interest loans, whether it's to do with uh, taxes, whether it's to do with planning reform. You know, what can the right in this country do to appeal to 18 to 24 year olds? Um, because, of course, you know, it's not the same everywhere. I mean, I think the UK is one of the few places where young people just aren't swinging right. Uh, I mean, in Canada, you have um, Pierre Pelovia, who's the leader of the Canadian Conservative Party, winning mass amounts of young people support. I mean, I think the Canadian Conservative Party um, has had more people has more young people in it than it ever has before. Uh, Trump in the United States is a very young, very uh, you know, good, sizable young following, uh, and also other groups across Europe do as well. And yet, Britain is one of the few countries which doesn't have that. Uh, and that whether the conditions are not right for it yet, I, I I simply don't know. Or maybe the ideas haven't been formed yet. I I also don't know. Um, but yeah, the Conservatives really, really went in for young people at this election. And for them to not receive much of their vote shouldn't really be a surprise. But to be honest with you, they weren't going for that vote anyway. Yeah. I can imagine a, a, a more on-the-nose policy than enslaving Zoomers to deliver <laughs> prescription drugs to boomers living in houses that Zoomers can't afford. I think that's just, that, that <laughs> perfectly perfectly embodies uh, kind of the state of, of, of politics in a, in a general sense in the West right now. Uh, but, but Connor, do you want to start the, the diving into to the man of the hour, the, the Nigel Farage, the, the most entertaining of uh, of the Brits out there? Yeah, that's that is, he certainly is the most entertaining, the most fun to watch. I think I'd, I'd like to start with a broader, uh, kind of a bigger picture um, look at this. My preferred way to look at politics in the U.S. is not really a left versus right, but an establishment versus anti-establishment kind of divide. Um, I, I think here. 
we have it, it's sort of characterized in the media as um, we have these two extremes, the extreme left to the extreme right, and they're battling it out with their extreme ideas when in fact it's kind of the reverse. We have a very um, powerful center who will act like they have these huge differences and they'll fight these you know very dramatic fights over you know whether the marginal top marginal tax rate should be two percent higher than it is or if it should stay the same. Could you give a little bit of a uh, a, a kind of breakdown of like what the British establishment is, who some of the anti-establishment forces are. I assume that Nigel Farage would uh, would fall in that category. But could you give us a bigger picture look at that? Sure. I mean, I, I would say there isn't much of a big picture here in the UK, really. I would say actually Farage is sort of the de facto head of that. And, and to talk about Farage, uh, my God, he has made this election something else. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know about this, but when the election was called, uh, it was often talked about at the beginning of the election, the reason Rishi Sunak called this election was predominantly in order to stop from Nigel Farage from running. Because there was always these whispers about Farage coming back and Farage had been teasing it for maybe two, three years, on both on his GB News show and at events and, and other places. Um, and Rishi Sunak called the election, uh, obviously, in, in the summer. Um, and it was assumed that Farage didn't have enough time to prepare. So what he would do, he was he would just wait and then in the autumn go over to the US and try and help Trump win the election. So you've sort of dealt with the reform and the Farage factor. And at the beginning of the election, Farage simply said, yep, yeah, I'm not going to run. And everyone became really disappointed by that, all, all of Farage's supporters, that is, um, because reform had been rising in the polls, although not rapidly. Uh, had been rising to about 12, 13%, which is not enough to gain any seats, especially not in the first past the post system, which is what we have here in the UK. Um, they might have got a sizable vote share uh, when the election called if Farage hadn't have run. Um, but when he said he wasn't running, there was, a, I think, a deep sense of betrayal among some reform voters. Um, and there was a deep seated sense of anger as well. I think Farage said at one of his press conferences, one of the reasons he decided to run in the end was because when he used to meet people on the campaign trail, because he did start to campaign with reform and said, I'll help nationally, but I won't do any local any local stuff and I won't try to win a seat. Uh, apparently somebody said to him, you know, why aren't you running? Why aren't you running? And Farage explained, you know, it's too, I won't be able to win a seat and it's too quick. And he started to get dismissed. People just started to go, all right, mate, fine. And that started to really chip away at Farage, realizing what he'd done. So the first Monday after the general election was called Reform Call a Conference. And uh, Farage says, I'm not just coming back, but I'm going to come back as leader. And I'm going to be leader for five years. And I'm also going to run for the seaside town of Clacton. Um, and he won. He won. And Farage uh, instilled a decent amount of energy into the reform campaign. At one point, they were leading the Tories by about one or two points in the polls. Of course, that didn't naturally translate into um, into the results on the election night. Um, but still, it's it's way better than what reform were expecting. Uh, they have four, I think, five MPs now, which is more than UKIP ever had, more than the Brexit party ever had. Uh, and that breakthrough has finally happened. Um, with Farage and anti-establishment more broadly, I mean, I think the issue is, is that Farage dominates a lot of that scene. And um, in terms of like what you would call anti-establishment politics, um, you, you've had a sort of return to establishment politics in the UK with this election. You have uh, the so called the, the proverbial adults back in the room, so to speak. The, uh, uh, the managerial elite are now back firmly where they belong, which is in the seats of power. Um, and uh, people, the commentariat, the media, uh, the wider uh, wider Westminster machine, they're loving it. They're having a great time because it's you know just like old times. Uh, we're a sensible, well-governed nation again, uh, not having to deal with the, the chaos of the Conservative Party, which you know is a fair criticism to some extent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that what you're going to see over the next five years is you might see an increasing anti-establishment presence from reform, but also what you might see is an increasing anti-establishment presence from the left because uh, the Green Party, which is easily to the left of Labour and is a more, as you can tell by the name, an environment-focused policy. They're very pro-net zero, uh, very pro-renewable uh, energy, 
Uh, although, of course, not building it, because if you build things, that would ruin the wildlife, which is always a key contradiction in their policy platform. Um, but they've also won four MPs, and that's quite a breakthrough for the, for the Greens, because uh, they only won one seat back in 2010, uh, which was Caroline Lucas, and she held on to that seat until this election when she when she stepped down for somebody else. Um, and if I'm honest, um, with the Labour Party being seen as centre-left or even centre-right by some people on the left, you might have an insurgency on the left from the Green Party, but of course also the now independent MP Jeremy Corbyn, who won his seat in Islington North by quite a handsome majority. Um, and he's still around in Parliament. Uh, he's still going to be causing trouble. Um, and also you have to worry about the Liberal Democrats now because the Liberal Democrats are now back in a big way. As I said earlier, they're sort of a centrist progressive party, but they are actually a bit more left wing than Labour on some issues, especially regarding health and social care and especially so on cultural issues. Um, so what you might see is a sort of coalition between uh, Greens and Lib Dems trying to force the Labour Party to be more left wing than it might want to be in office. Um, but again, that's not really an anti-establishment thing. I would say that's predominantly a, a left-right issue. Um, so to just take it back to the to the beginning, I mean, I think Farage just dominates this space to such a such a large extent, and I think he will continue to dominate this space for the next five years. And whether reform gets more support, whether Farage, you know, goes up in people's estimations or, or not, is something we're going to have to see. But it's it's certainly interesting to see him in Parliament finally, and I'm certainly very interested to see what on earth he might do over the next five years, because now he has the ability to speak on a national platform in Parliament, which is something he's wanted to do for a very, very, very long time. Well, and, and Farage, I think, is so fascinating because, you know, for, for being someone who has, again, this first time in Parliament, right, someone who has always been on the political fringe, you know, it, it seems as if the modern kind of British political system in lar large part is defined by Farage. Obviously, you had Brexit, right? You, you had... Um, you know, UKIP, um, which was always very charismatic at the uh, European Parliament. Um, you know, Godfrey Bloom, you know, great, uh, great, great Austrian in his own right. He has, he has some, some great clips over there uh, uh, quoting Rothbard and the like. But it was all kind of directed towards the UK's relationship with the EU. Um, and, you know, just one thing, just watching the debates with Farage is just the, the personality and talent, um, you know, which is you know, charisma as a political weapon is you know something that transcends ideology it transcends these battle of ideas it transcends kind of deep theory and things like that um in in terms of, of getting people motivated and interested and i know you know, conversations that i've had offline with you conversations i've had with uh supporters of the institute from the uk there has been just this feeling of depression of of hopelessness at kind of what the conservative party was doing obviously the left is the left and just you know, finding any sort of opportunity for a, an alternative voice um, of, of again, trying to deal with some of these systemic issues, for trying to push back against this you know, this, this regime, trying to 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 give a spark there. You know, is, do you do you see the reform project as something that can have lasting value? Obviously, it's, it's very difficult to dislodge the personality of Farage from that political movement. Right when we saw when when Farage left the UK or U UKIP, right, UKIP fell apart. When, when Farage was kind of leading the reform movement as a candidate, right, the, the reform kind of did nothing. He, he is now and this is his party leader. Um, is this something that can give reform some legs so that, you know, in the future, um, you know, these, these you know, young, particularly con conservative leaning individuals can, can, can mobilize behind a banner? Is, 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 there, is there hope basically in British politics for some of these serious changes, not in the you know, next, not, not during this parliament, but in the future, um, because of you know the kind of the foothold, the foot in the door that this election has offered to these anti-establishment political parties. Mm. I think in regards to Farage specifically, it's actually going to depend a lot on him um, because he is in complete control of the party. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Reform UK is not set up like a traditional political party. It doesn't have membership. It's set up like a small business, set up like a startup, essentially, where he's a sex essentially a CEO of a party, of, of a group, basically. And he holds all decision making, all final decision making. And he also micromanages basically everything as well. Um, so if Farage were to give reform some level of democratization, say in the form of associations or a youth wing 
or uh, allowing members to vote on certain policies like many other political parties do, such as Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Um, it could have some legs. Um, but I think in, in the current circumstances, it's really, really too hard to tell. Um, I think certainly there's a level of despondency uh, amongst the young, but again, a lot of them aren't really flocking to reform. There were a lot of polls that came out originally saying that reform is the second biggest party with 18 to 24 year olds, which was quite a big deal, really. And it was written in every newspaper and uh, and, and hilariously even um, uh, reform was the second biggest party with 16 to 17 year olds. So people who couldn't even vote, uh, you know, were, were, were pro Farage. And that to some extent, uh, due to his presence on on social media, especially TikTok, and him completely dominating uh, that platform, while the Labour and the Conservative Party didn't really know how to use it, uh, although they both had some level of success uh, in their own funny little ways. Um, but I would say with the actual voting, um, the fact that only pff, maybe eight percent, I think only around eight percent of people aged 18 to 24 voted reform at this election, according to recent polling. And like I said, it was just over 14 percent for the Tories. So even when it comes to voting for the so-called right in this country, um, young people's minds will still immediately go to the Conservative Party. And whether reform is able to break through that is going to be interesting. Again, a lot of this relies on Farage. Uh, we've only had one intervention from Farage in Parliament, and that was only due to um, uh, the Speaker being elected. Uh, but he certainly made a bit of a splash. He called the last uh, Speaker of the House uh, a, a little man who, uh, of course, I'm referring to John Burko, who um, famously in, in the UK is known for... Um, uh, his uh, rather loud and uh, rather loud uh, and exciting voice, um, and he was uh, derided essentially because he was seen as a biased member of Parliament, but also a biased uh, Speaker of the Chair who favoured uh, Remain Europhile uh, MPs and favoured Britain staying in the European Union, even though after it had already voted to leave the European Union. Um, but yeah, Farage gave that old speaker a bit of a kicking, uh, which I, you know, people found amusing, but you heard groans from the government benches and indeed from the opposition benches, people shaking their heads in in abject disgust. Um, so if whether Farage might just do that for five years, that might be interesting because he did that in the European Union quite a lot. He just stood up and attacked people. Whether he will do that for the next five years rather than concentrating on building up a wider movement or building up a policy, which is what he said he will do, will be interesting. Um, so, yeah, like, like I said at the beginning, it's going to rely a lot on Farage and also a lot on the people he has around him, including the new reform MPs. Lee Anderson, who switched from Labour to the Tories and now is a reform MP. Um, who was likely to lose if he'd stayed with the Tories, actually, but moved over to reform and won his seat. Uh, Rupert Lau, who's the new MP for Great Yarmouth. Um, there's also Richard Tice, who, of course, was leader of reform uh, for a decent while before Farage um, came back. And then you also have a new lad in Essex who is, a, I think, a 28-year-old uh, city, city, city Essex kid, uh, which will be interesting to see what he does as well. But he's quite fresh-faced and new. Um, and only won by about 20 votes, I think, which is which is, shows you how it really can come down to the wire here in the UK. Uh, they were up till about 11 a.m. The, the next day after the election because they kept wanting the votes to be recounted. Um, but in, in terms of uh, whether there is any hope for the future, I think I think, you know, I've said before, whether it be on this podcast or or online, you have to be hopeful for everything. Um, you can never believe that your situation is hopeless and you can never believe that your cause is hopeless because what's the point in politics after all? And, you know, these swings do happen. These swings do happen. Like I said earlier, Thatcher was able to win 40 percent of the youth vote. There's no reason why a Conservative Party or even reform can do that in the future, providing they prevent present actual definable policies on tax, on spending, on debt, on house building, on all the things that young people care about, but all the things that actually benefit a country more generally when in regards to growth and in regards to uh, making sure that your country is wealthy and happy. Um, so I would say I would, I'm going to keep optimistic for the future, um, whether either of reform or the Tories or even Labour are able to provide any of that optimism is something I'm not quite sure on yet. Um, but it's certainly going to be an interesting time over the next five years because there's so many new MPs, so many new parties in Parliament. And uh, my God, PMQs is going to be an absolute blinder. It's going to be hilarious to watch Keir Starmer versus the Greens versus whoever the Tories pick versus Farage versus Corbyn. It's going to be... Uh, 
uh, it's going to be a proper show. So uh, to my American friends across the pond, if you're ever free on a Wednesday, uh, please do tune into British Politics PMQs, Prime Minister's Questions, because you're going to find some uh, some fun stuff there. Fun stuff indeed. One quick question. Um just regarding uh, the time frame of this. It's sort of disorienting watching this as an American because I'm, I'm used to elections that last years. I mean, the the election season we've been in um, has been you know going on for a long time here. And my understanding is um, it's it was six weeks after um, the previous prime minister um, announced. And so all this seemed to happen so fast um, from my perspective as an American. Um, so that's one thing that... Um, this all has me excited about is the fact that this really feels like the beginning of, you know, Farage coming back and the Reform Party uh, kind of coming into the, the form that it's in now. Um, but do I have that time frame correct? Like, so was the Reform Party um, a thing before Farage? I think you just mentioned you made it sound like that. Uh, could, could you just kind of give us the, the background um, to kind of kind of bring us up the ramp to where we are now and where we're going into the future? Yeah, sh- sure. No, and you're completely right. UK elections are really fast. It's six weeks um, and the votes are counted in one night. And by the next morning, you have a new government. Uh, and of course, that's predominantly because we're a lot smaller country than than you are. And also our system is designed to work in that way. Um, and it's quite clean, actually, in the way that it happens, whereby um, you know, by the time uh, the prime minister, Rishi Sunak at the time, has uh, given his last speech at the steps of Downing Street and left. Um, five minutes later, Keir Starmer pulls in uh, and you've got a prime minister within five minutes, uh, which is absolutely, uh, absolutely insane. But that's one of the, the good things about our system really is how fast everything is um, and how the fact that um, also they have uh, they have competitions in certain constituencies over who can get the vote in the fastest. So uh, especially areas like in Sunderland, for example, they always try and be the first to declare. And you have these um, six formers running with big boxes of votes, uh, you know, to different tables and trying to get it all done as, as fast as possible, which is fun. Um, but yeah, it's British politics when it gets to elections is is fast and it feels like a complete fever dream while you're in it. Um, and if you work in politics, you get very little sleep. Uh, you get very little time to yourself. You're always plugged in because the media cycle, of course, being 24 hours now is just so all consuming. Um, but it's, it is horrendously good fun and politics is its own kind of drug. And I, I absolutely adore it for that. Uh, in terms of reform, yes. Yeah, so they were a political party before the general election. Um, so they came out of what was the then Brexit party, which uh, won the European elections in 2019, which Farage has set up once he'd left, left UKIP. Um, but after the general election in 2019, where the Brexit party and Farage stood back from a lot of conservative seats because Farage was terrified that he wasn't cutting through enough. And also the fact that he thought Boris Johnson might not be that bad. And he also didn't want Corbyn to win a, a Labour government, uh, which is you know a, a fair comment. But he stood back, I think, ooh, over 300 candidates for the Brexit party in order to let the Tories get a free round, essentially. And after that election, Farage just decided, you know, no more politics for me. I retire. Uh, I'm going to go on GB News. I'm going to go abroad. Uh, I'm going to go help Trump. I'm going to do what I want to do. Uh, and, you know, fair enough, that's that's perfectly acceptable to do. But Richard Tice uh, and a few others decided to stay and they turned the Brexit Party into Reform UK. And for many years, it didn't have an absolute ton of cut through, if I'm perfectly honest with you. Um, whether that's down to Tice or whether that's down to the messaging, I, 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 I couldn't comment. I, I genuinely don't know. Um, but They have, like I said earlier, been rising in the polls over the last, I'd say over the last year or two, really, ever since Sunak came in. Um, And we're hitting 12, 13 percent of the polls and we're coming, you know, comfortable thirds in by-elections and the like. Um, But again, it wasn't until Farage came back where reform was given this second sort of wind whereby... Everyone was energetic. Everyone was excited uh, to the point where they got five MPs. I mean, I think one exit poll predicted they would get 13 MPs overall, which you know would have been uh, insane for, for, for reform, absolutely mental, considering they only came back maybe a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, whether they're able to maintain this momentum will be interesting to see. Um, of course, we still have a Tory leadership election coming up, which could take some of the wind out of their sails, uh, depending on who they get in. Um, but it's going to be a very interesting time in politics. We have a left-wing government in power, a right in a complete meltdown and in a complete civil war. 
um, and an insurgent left with the Greens and Corbyn uh, attempting to make the current Labour Party more left wing than it currently is. So there's a lot going to be going on and I'm going to be hoping to keep my eye on absolutely all of it. And I wholeheartedly recommend that, uh, even though you guys have something coming up later this year, I believe. I'm not quite sure what that might, might be, which will certainly be exciting. Uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, worth keeping on your uh, on your friends across the pond because um, British politics is going to be very, very interesting for the next five years. Um, and there's going to be a lot uh, which will be of interest to uh, not just myself, but uh, for, you know, friends of the Mises Institute and indeed uh, American friends. And before we get out of here, um, kind of leaving on on that note, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things about the UK is, you know, in America we've got a lot of libertarian institutions, some better than others. Um, but it seems that even within kind of the the realm of kind of broadly defined libertarianism, you had some institutions that were strongly anti-Brexit. And sort of proudly took on the, the label of, of neoliberal. Um, you, know, you, have, you have certain think tanks that kind of became more moderate over time, away from that sort of Thatcherism um, that you described earlier. Which, for any of the for the critiques, at least, kind of sparked a little bit of um, you know a, a, a free market, um, a more a, a more hard edged approach on some of these reforms. Obviously, taxpayer alliance, you know, focusing on lower taxes, uh, uh, lower spending. Obviously, issues that are good no matter where you are out there. But what uh, for, for any libertarian friends in the UK, um, you know, Mises Institute guys um, and girls, and we're, we're, you know, diversity is our strength. Um, what, uh, what, are, what are some of the, you know, beyond politics itself, what are some, um, obviously, we have friends at the Cobden Center, um, who I know last year had a great documentary about fiat currency, ex nihilo, um, highly recommend checking that out. But what, what are some, some areas that um, for if, if you're a, if, if there's any young libertarians out there looking for places to um, you know, institutions to, to look at for um, organizing things like that. Any advice that you have um, as a as a, a young Mises uh, fan out in the UK um, to kind of help kind of build that network and to, to, to connect with your folks? Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing to do is, of course, keep an eye on what the Taxpayers Alliance is doing. Um, I've only just joined, um, but we've got a good few things down the road. Um, we are doing a lot of work on the moment about national debt. I will actually be launching a campaign about national debt because nobody in the UK seems to want to talk about this. But of course, this is screwing over young people in particular by the fact that, you know, the level of interest that we're paying on the debt is going to increase year on year on year. And it's going to be young people now who are going to be saddled with that level of debt for the rest of their lives. And this interest rate will keep going up and up and up to the point where um, you know, maybe 15% of GDP will be spent on paying off debt interest, maybe 20%. And then how on earth are people going to be able to afford frontline services? How on earth is there going to be enough room for cut tax cuts? Um, and is it really right that young people are saddled with the debts of their previous generation? I would say absolutely not. Um, so that's one thing we're working on at the moment, which is great. Um, another thing we've got in the works is also talking about uh, beer duty, talking about the fact that um, nightlife in this country has completely and utterly collapsed. Uh, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that uh, alcohol is taxed extremely highly. Um, I mean, I think almost 20 to 30 percent of a, a bit of alcohol is <laughs> is is, is tax, uh, which is absolutely crazy. Um, and if people aren't being encouraged to drink because it's too expensive, then Pubs will go under, nightclubs will go under, um, and that's detrimental to uh, functioning economy and detrimental to young people as well. Um, in terms of organising, uh, I think in regards to universities, when I was at university, I used to run a libertarian society. If you are at university and there is a libertarian society at your uni, please do indeed join it. And if you do want any free stuff, please do contact the Taxpayers Alliance. We'll be more than happy to give you uh, sunglasses and uh, lighters and all that fun stuff. Um, but also um, do keep your head up and do keep your shin up. Uh, don't feel like it's all over, whether because Labour's in or the Conservatives haven't provided you with anything. Uh, things can change. Um, you know, a week is a short time in politics. Uh, a year, you know, in a year, two years, three years, things could be completely different than they are now. Uh, we don't know if this Labour government's going to last the five years. It might do. They might do some decent things, which, you know, is ultimately a good thing. Um and the Conservative Party might suddenly decide to become a party that, you know, refines its values and goes back to being uh, more about free markets and housing and, you know, opportunity and all those good things that we people enjoy. Um, but I'd say, you know, keep your heads up, guys. Um, things, uh, you know, I'm not going to say things can only get better because that's a bit of a new Labour Blairite line. Uh, but things 
um, can get better. And I think that the more people are engaged on our side of the argument, the better, um, because the more voices there are, the louder we can be and the more effective we can be in the future. So yeah, chin up guys. And of course, keep an eye on all the stuff we're doing here at the Taxpayers Alliance. And for anyone interested in following you and your work, uh, where can they do so? Sure. So for my organization generally, if you're on Twitter, I would say at the underscore TPA. Uh, if you're on Facebook, just type in Taxpayers Alliance, you'll find us on there. Um, for me personally, uh, at Yarwood William is the best place to find me. That's my Twitter account. Uh, those followed me for many years. Connor's, Connor's just recently started following me, I believe. Um, so, uh, and I took a pretty long hiatus uh, because I, I worked in, uh, I worked, I worked for the state for a little bit, which is uh, not something I'm necessarily very proud of. But um, uh, I had to keep my uh, my mouth uh, closed. But now I'm uh, back in. Uh, back in the real world, I can get to sort of talking again, which is great. So if you do want to hear more of my opinions, uh, why you'd want to do that, I don't know. But nevertheless, if you do, uh, at Yarwood William on Twitter is the place to find me. And I'm sure uh, Connor and Tho will at me in the post once this has been uploaded. Well, always enjoy talking with you, William. Um, this was a f fun conversation. Um, you know, I enjoy politics perhaps too, too much, but that includes even the UK because it doesn't matter if you're US uh, the, the UK, throughout Europe, around the world, we, we must repeal this 20th century and all the evils that came with it. So that is what we try to do here every week here on Radio Rothbard. Uh, Connor, any any last closing uh, closing remarks? Uh, this was great. I mean, some as somebody who is also obsessed with politics but has not been following British politics that much, this has been helpful. I think I'm in a position now to start uh, following along, and I hope some of the listeners are too. Excellent. Well, for William, for Connor, this is Tho Bishop. Thank you for listening to Radio Rothbard. We'll be back next week with Mr. Ryan McMakin, and we will uh, see you next week. Yeah.